When you guys got together, is it all about 1970? You talk about your kids now. What What's the general topic of conversation when you guys uh, have this reunion? How much fun they made of me behind my back <laughs> when I was working my fanny off. You guys concur that that's basically the... Yeah, that's part, that's part of it, but we uh, just reminisce a lot about different things that happened during the season, and uh, uh, and not only the 70 season, but other seasons too, things that happened, so it, uh, we had a lot of laughs, uh, and uh, last night we had dinner at uh, Morton's, and uh, we really had a great time, and you know, you have some of these guys I haven't seen in 40 years, and probably the last time I see them, so uh, it's uh, important. You know, you, got, you guys won three straight pennants, 69, 70, 71. Because you guys only won the World Series in, in 1970, do you feel that sometimes this team is overlooked as one of the great teams of our lifetime because the fact that you, quote unquote, only won one World Series? I believe that's true. Uh, 109 games, 108 games, and uh, 101. <coughs> Only one other team won 100 games uh, three years in a row, and that was the early 40s, the St. Louis Cardinals. And the Yankees never did that. You know, as great as they were, and I'm not putting them down, but this is one of the best teams that was ever put together, I believe, in the history of baseball. What made it so, what made it so great? <laughs> Only kidding. In the obvious? <laughs> Look behind me, that's all. Oh, okay. Look, look behind me. That that's what made it so great. Earl, could you and a, a bunch of you guys, if you will, address the state of the franchise now as you look back out on what's going on right now and compare it to the glory days? I know that's been asked repeatedly, but that's on everyone's mind. Well, myself, maybe somebody can talk to it that's closer to the team right now because I really don't have an answer for that. Uh, we got Jim Palmer up there who's, you know, following the team every every day and probably might be the best guy to ask. I know, Frank, that a lot of them are closer to it than I am. So I just like to think that we do not have the kind of leadership and coaches that we need here to make this a better organization, put it in an organization like we had when we were all playing. Uh, there's no structure here. There's no leadership here. Until we get that, we're going to continue to struggle the way we're struggling. Davey and Frank, I'd be curious in what you had to say. Uh, I just, uh, I want Paul to really tell it like he is. How does he feel? <laughs> He's holding back, really. Unbelievable. No, I, I, I am not going to sit here and uh, try to tell you what's wrong with this organization or this team right now. But it, it saddens me to see uh, the course that this team, this organization has taken for quite a number of years now, 13, 14 years. And it bothers me and uh, I don't feel good about it because uh, I always take a lot of pride in having worn this uniform and always will. And it just bothers me right now and hopefully they can get it going sometime in the next year. I know they've been saying that for a number of years. And I know they're trying, but uh, they just haven't had the right mix. No, I, I, I kind of get those questions every night when I'm up there hawking my roast beef and stuff, and people are coming up and saying, why don't you make a comeback? And I said, well, I, said, well, I can still hit. Can you run for me? You know? <laughs> so if I do it right, you won't have to run very hard. So That was our mentality. And in the, in the room last night, when we all got together, it was almost like uh, 1970 all over again. There were, no, there were no changes in the feelings that we have for each other. It's like I told, I told Davey, you know, I said, you know, you remember how good we were? You know, that uh, the only way you were going to get a ground ball between us was with a 30-06. You couldn't do it with a 22. And of course, the older we get, the better we get. <laughs> and in the World Series, we even loaded the bases up for our pitcher. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's right. Davey, you were the last manager that uh, guided this franchise to a winning season. Uh, you know, what, what, do you, what have you seen transpire since then? And do you have fond memories? I realize we're here to celebrate 70, but of those two years, 96 and 97. 
Well, you know, I love Baltimore. All my kids were born here. Uh, you know, I, we had great years uh, playing here. Uh, you know, I really enjoyed managing here. We had some fun. We came up short. Uh, you know, all of us hate to see uh, Baltimore fall in hard times. Uh, they've got a lot of, they've got a nucleus of some pretty good young players. You know, I look for them to be, I keep looking for them to bounce back and start doing the things that they're capable of doing. Uh, as far as commenting on what's going on, I'm, I'm working down the beltway, you know, for the Nationals. But uh, my heart is here in Baltimore. I wish, you know, hope that they straighten it out and start winning. Amber. Uh, we got one of those uh, plays where they could have used the instant replay. Uh, right field, the guy reaching over the fence, remember? Garcia? Oh my. I died with that one. Tarasco, right? Amber. Boog, you had talked about uh, how much fun you all had together and how when you get back together, it's that same kind of camaraderie. Would you say with, with that team that, that did win the pennant three years straight, that the camaraderie came before the winning, or did the winning bring sort of that camaraderie and that pride? Well, the winning's got a lot to do with it. You know, you can't have any fun when you're losing. That, that's a cinch. And we had our kangaroo court where Frank put the mop over his head. And uh, everybody took their turn at being uh, ridiculed, and I say ridiculed pretty good at that time. Even the judge got it once in a while. And uh, it was enjoyable. I think everybody, anybody who had seen that uh, uh, kangaroo court uh, really enjoyed it. We only had it after wins. Can I just make a point? The, the yeah. point is, is that you know, it's kind of interesting, uh, you know, they're talking about a managerial change and, you know, you go out and you're working out and you're right, you're on the stationary bike and, you you know, your mind can't go anywhere. And you're thinking, the great thing, and Earl just mentioned, is the only time we had the kangaroo court was when we won. And when we won, we stayed in the locker room for 15, 20 minutes, sometimes longer. I mean, we had the uh, Don Buford Red Ass Award because he used to get upset when he would get the No Touch Award, which was named after Chico Simone. But it, it made, yeah, well, um, I don't know, we had the John O'Donoghue Long Ball Award, whoever threw the ball 430 feet would get that. Um, but it made you stay together, and it made you talk about your wins. It made you pay attention because if you yawned, if you didn't talk about baseball on the bench, you'd get fined. If you didn't work hard in the outfield, you would get fined. Now, it was all done in fun, but it was done in winning fun. And the one thing, and I really got in touch with this today when we had the luncheon, and Earl touched on it. You know, he, he was saying, you just look at all these players around, this is why I was a good manager. Well, Earl was a great manager. You know, he knew the numbers before anybody else. But the bottom line was, he says, if you don't have the players and you don't develop them and they don't understand it, Frank touched on this, if you don't really know how to play the game, you don't win. You don't win as much as you would like. So in one broad reference to what has to go on here, they need to get better players, they need to learn how to play the game, and they need to play together as one. And whoever comes in, it's not about winning. I mean, Davey Johnson told me when he took the job here in 96, he said, you know what, my teams usually pay up to their capabilities. So whoever manages here, that's what they need to get this organization to do. Whatever level it is, be them, make them or allow them or show them the way, which is what the Orioles did. Because, Brooks, did, did you just come up, were you a Hall of Famer in your first year in the big leagues? No, you struggled. Paul struggled. I struggled. I don't know about Frank. Boo. We all, Davey Johnson. We all went through, we all went through growing up periods. And a lot of our young players are going through that. And if you just think you come to the big leagues because somebody gave you six and a half million dollars or three point two million dollars and you have all the answers, you're a fool. Simple as that. So they need to get better players. They need to coach them up, and they, that's when they'll start winning ball games. Because that's what other organizations do. David, uh, Frank, you you had done great things obviously before you ever got to Baltimore, and you did great things after you uh, left here. What what made Baltimore special? What made being with this organization special for you? The people, the people here, uh, the respect we had for each other. No one was bigger than anyone else. There was no what you call superstars here. It's just that some of us had better years than others at the time. But we played and thought and felt for each other as a team. We did the things we had to do for the team. 
and it was just great being with these guys. We had a lot of fun, and not just because we were winning. We had fun, period. We would laugh and joke and kid each other, even when we were in bad times, just to try to get guys to loosen up. And uh, the one thing I say is, covers it all. We respected each other, and we did the little things to help each other be successful. As I said earlier, and I know he won't admit it, Earl didn't like for myself, Boog, and, and Brooksy to give ourselves up to get a man over the third base. But we did it anyway in the right situation because we knew it was the right thing to do because he couldn't make us take it back. We got him to third. We got him to third, yeah, then some too. But uh, a lot of times we got him third because if I would do it for Brooks, Brooks would do it for Boog, Boog would do it for somebody else. That's the way we were. And that's what he thought about. And that's what made, no, you didn't think about it. You knew that was the thing to do, that's all. And that's what made this, uh, and this organization so special to all of us, basically. It was the people here and the way we felt for each other. Uh, Dan. To kind of follow up on the whole people thing, um, was last night and today a little bit bittersweet for you guys? Because obviously you've been able to get together with some of the, you know, some of your teammates, but several of them, several key guys have passed away in the last few years. Can I just talk? Doesn't matter which one of you. Talk about how bittersweet this moment is. Yeah, well, it is bittersweet, and uh, uh, we've got a few of the the wives whose uh, husbands have passed of here, and I think that's terrific that they would come up here and be part of this uh, ceremony. And uh, as I said before, some of them I haven't seen in 40 years, and it's probably the last time I see them again. But every guy, you know, it seems like uh, if you win a world championship, uh, every, every time you think about it, every player you think about brings a big smile to your face, and you think of the, some of the humorous things that happen along the way. And uh, that's exactly what it is. You know, being part of a, a World Series, it, it, you have to think of how many players never even got to a World Series. I, I talked to George Kell, God rest his soul, uh, from Arkansas, and George uh, was a terrific player, and the one thing that he felt like he missed in his career was a World Series, Ferguson Jenkins. All these guys talk about it, and the list goes on and on. And to be part of something special like this that uh, so many people enjoyed and so many players enjoyed it, it's just, uh, it's, it's a kind of, this will be the last time, the last reunion for the 1970 team. Let me, let me speak to that, just one little brief thing here. Uh, and I'll do it this way. I saw a, a great piece of uh, artwork in uh, the Cincinnati uh, Clubhouse in spring training. It had the starting lineup of the 1956 team, and it had the two starting pitchers, an extra backup catcher, and it was a great piece when I first saw it. I was excited about it, I wanted it. And so they sent it to me. And when I got it and I looked at it, I looked at it real good at that time, it's only two of us still living. And that saddened me. I have not put that piece up on my wall. I just can't do it. And that's the thing about coming back here and seeing some of the players missing from the, the 70 team that's passed on. It, it saddens us. We had we had pretty we had special memories though for for everybody and like my special memories and we were thinking about it the other day is to be playing first base while Mike Cuellar was pitching was a wonderful thing because he made people look really funny swinging the bat. I mean they get on on that front foot and they would swing the bat like eight miles an hour and I'd be at first base laughing, you know, and Mike would look at me and he couldn't laugh because that's showing the hitter up, you know, but he would turn towards Paulie in center field, you know, and he'd be laughing. <laughs> and it was just, it was the way that we did it. I mean, it was the way that we, uh, we played. And I think about things like that and think about those relationships that we had and laughing at each other having funny swings too. That, I don't think you can do that today. Rich. Can we go back to a year before 1970? 1969, you guys were heavily favored to, to, beat, the, to beat the Mets, and, and you didn't. How much of 1970 was showing people that you were really wronged in, in, in 1969? Well, a lot of it. We run into a buzzsaw. Uh, at the time, 
Uh, nobody knew who Tom Seaver was. Nobody who knew who Nolan Ryan was. We got bad scouting reports on the other two, Kuzman and Gentry. Uh, our scouts said, D don't worry about Gentry. He don't throw the ball hard. Well, we found out he threw the ball pretty hard. And uh, their pitching staff was much, much underrated. You don't win a National League pennant unless you got a pretty good pitching staff. And uh, it wasn't that we took them for granted, believe me. It was that uh, in that short time, uh, they performed as well as anybody could perform, I guess, with what they had. It was a terrible time for us to go into a slump. And I think we were a little over anxious, but uh, we made up for it the following year. David. Which of those three teams was the best team? All of them. <laughs> you got a favorite, Polly, I know. I heard you on the radio the other day. <laughs> In my estimation, the 1969 Orioles was the best team that was ever assembled. Ever. My own opinion, ever. I mean, that was an absolutely Great, great team. We just made that one mistake. But Snake, uh, we lost to the Mets. Uh, but 41 years still, 41 years ago, I still can't believe they beat us. I believe in my heart, if we played them 100 times, we'd have beat them 90. But for those uh, five games, they wound up beating us. You know, 1970 was all about spring training. Uh, we went to Mexico. Uh, we we were five and two uh, after the, left on a Thursday night. Go down and play a weekend World Series or the ser weekend series against the Mexico City Reds. And um, on Friday night, Pete Rickard, who is here, was on that ball club. We have a seven to five lead. He throws a three run home run to some big strong right handed guy. We lose eight to seven. Earl comes in, not very happy, yelling, screaming. Uh, doing all, you know, not that Earl ever did that, but um, he's doing all this and he said, you know, we've already lost 60% of all the games we, lo we lost last spring. And that's when it started for me. We had to go to Mexico, nobody really wanted to go there only because it's an interruption spring training, but here you are, you've already, what, played eight games and Earl's telling you that, you know what, we're, we're not going to let what happen against the Mets, even though if you go back and look at that series, they good team, got the breaks, got the calls, blah, blah, blah. Bottom line, it all started for me in the eighth game of spring training, and that's what Earl was about. I mean, Earl, Earl was about if you didn't do the job, not that these guys didn't, but if you didn't do the job, you'd put somebody else out there that was going to do it. And that's the way this franchise was run back then. I just want to say something now. As far as the pitching and the six-inning stuff is concerned during the course of the season, believe this or not, I tried in spring training to get each one of my starters to pitch nine innings in spring training. So when they opened the season, their arm was in shape. They weren't going to hurt themselves. Uh, I'm looking at 12 pitchers in a game going two-thirds of an inning in spring training. And I'm wondering to myself, how are they ever going to go an inning? How are they going to go two innings? They, I just don't understand it. Jen. Earl, does, is there any one move that you made in 1970 stand out to you? In 1970? No, I think it was 68 when I took over the ball club. And that was, uh, well, number one, I was lucky enough to watch, por in, in, manage in Puerto Rico and watch Elrod hit some home runs down there. Because Andy might have been having some trouble handling some right-handers. Now, Andy played against right-handers and could hit them a little bit. But Elrod could hit you some home runs out of there. I used to get 20, 22 home runs out of Elrod and Andy, which is pretty good for a catching position. The other thing is Donnie Buford. As I said upstairs, I was fortunate enough to manage against him in the minor leagues. When they had signed him, the White Sox had signed him as a center fielder. Uh, why they moved him to second base, the White Sox, I don't know. But uh, he, when we traded for him, he was a second baseman. But I knew offensively how much a guy like Donnie Buford could help a ball club uh, on base percentage. 
He could hit a home run. Well, he hit 19 home runs, too. Uh, but uh, those just kind of melted onto our club and really helped us. I'm not saying that we wouldn't have won with these people that are behind me, that we wouldn't have won without them, but they certainly helped. Amber. Well, you joke about the players making fun of you behind your back, but everybody knew how much respect they had for you. When you look at modern Are day... You sure? <laughs> well, that's what I've been told. I wasn't around in 1970. Right. <laughs> uh, but you look at the managers today and the different relationships between players and managers. Do you, If you put yourself in a managerial role today, do you feel like it would be very difficult to get that same amount of respect? And what was your style, and how were you able to do that? I would think so. You know, I don't think Joe Torre has any trouble. I don't think Tony LaRusso has any trouble. Bobby Cox doesn't have any trouble. Uh, the managers are out there, and I'm sure there's more. Well, this Joe Madden is making a name for himself. Uh, he seems to come up with the right words at the right time all the time and doing the right thing. So the managers are out there, and the ball players respect them. Uh, the object is for you to make sure you scout good, both amateur and professional when you're making a trade to get the right type of player. You know, we made one big mistake when I was managing. I'm not even going to talk about it, but it caused me more headaches than anything in the world. For, uh, Frank and for Davey, um, how much of Earl is in or what became, what, how much of Earl was in your managerial styles once you guys became managers? Well, I'll tell you, you know, Earl's, and he talks about uh, the pitchers and how he does things with pitchers, and he talks about the things he did with when he first came in here with Buford and uh, Elrod. Well, you know, he, he was just a shrewd uh, manager. I mean, what people don't give him credit for is he was probably the best handler of a pitching staff I've ever played for. Uh, you know, he jokes around uh, expecting these guys to go nine innings, but he set up a bullpen. I watched him set up a bullpen for years, and I watched him use the bullpen. And I have to say, I've never seen anybody use it as well as he did. Uh, you can joke about having these pitchers go nine innings. Well, he had guys like McNally, Cuellar, Palmer, uh, Dobson, I mean, that they were awfully good pitchers. But he used the bullpen a lot, but he was a great handler of pitchers. And I think today, if you can handle pitchers, pitching staff, you have a chance to be a good manager in the big leagues. Yeah, I think uh, the reason uh, I had uh, such respect for Earl was the fact that uh, here was a, a fellow out of St. Louis, Missouri, who didn't want to do anything in his whole life except play for the St. Louis Cardinals and found out that he did not have the ability to be a big league player. Uh, he went back to uh, uh, Thomasville, Georgia, and started out in D, C, B, A, double A, triple A, major leagues, and Hall of Fame. And uh, that really impressed me. And the same true for Davey. Davey, it's not like he got the job right away uh, with, uh, who did you manage, the Mets? Man, but anyway, but he, oh yeah, you meant okay. But I mean, he went to the minor leagues and uh, and learned his trade uh, even better, and right to the big leagues. Not that you have to do that. Uh, Frank Robinson stepped right into a big league job, and that that worked out well too. You can call it big leagues if you want to. Oh, Cleveland. <laughs> time Cleveland was not big league. <laughs> Frank Frank served two years in Puerto Rico. Yeah. As an apprentice, managing. I don't know if you you knew that or not. But, uh, you know, it was a good experience. And there's some pretty good ball players down there. When, uh, when I managed, I had Cepeda at first. I had Tony Perez at third, Davey Johnson at second, Paul Blair in center field, Elrod Hendricks catching. That's a pretty good winner, winner team. Did you win? Yes. Certainly. How many, how many games? How many games? We were the champs. How many games? Frank, Frank and Seven. Seventy. Seventy. They only played seventy-two. I don't know. I was like seventy. Yeah, you won. You undefeated. Oh, I don't know. We were the champs. That's all that's at all. Uh, no. Thank you. No, the thing I uh, admired about Earl the most was the way he handled his twenty-five man roster. When you left home during the day to come to the ballpark, you had to position yourself and get yourself ready 
because you probably would be used before that game was over. He wasn't afraid to use anyone on his roster to win a ball game that day. And he resurrected some careers that he doesn't get credit for. Guys like Benny Ayala, uh, Ron Renneke, uh, Jim Dwyer. He, he got those guys in a platoon situation and got the most out of the, the, the situation that uh, helped them have prolonged their career. And uh, you know, when you go to manage, you can take some of the good, eliminate the bad, but what you have to do is manage the way you feel and what you feel. Because at that time, Earl is not there. You have to do what you have to do. Because if you try to, if I'm going to try to emulate Earl, I'm going to be thinking, that, well, what, Earl, what would Earl do? And that situation is gone already. You have to be ahead of the game a couple of two or three innings, and you have to trust your players is what you do. And that's what he did with the best of them. Frank, since we're talking about managing, I wanted to ask you a question related to your time in, in Washington. How is your relationship with the team now, and how do you feel about the development of the squad as it's constructed now? How did I uh, enjoy my time in Washington? It was great. It was exciting coming back to Washington, bringing baseball back to Washington and being a part of it. The fans were outstanding. You know, even when we were having our tough times, you know, you go out on the streets and you would think people would be asking you, what's wrong with you guys? And it's the, no, we, they say, you guys were great last night. I said, we lost. They said, we don't care. You're here. And that was, it was a great atmosphere. And uh, my situation with the ball club now is better than it was the organization. Uh, for a while there, I uh, didn't want to be anywhere near it. As a matter of fact, I think they had a restraining order against me coming to the ballpark or being around the ballpark. But the, it, is, uh, it is relaxed a little bit more now. And, uh, it's a more casual, or cordial, I'm sorry, uh, than it was. And so I, uh, I've watched them. I watch them an awful lot uh, on TV. I watch a lot of baseball, period. But I think they're headed in the right direction now. Uh, they seem to be drafting uh, correctly and getting good talented kids and signing them and putting them in the minor leagues and handling them correctly, preparing them correctly to come to the big leagues. And they're bringing them to the big leagues and allowing them to play and grow at the major league level. And, uh, they're an exciting ball club, and I think if they stay on the track, they're going to be successful in a very short period of time. Dan. I won't make this the Frank Robinson show, but I've got another question for you here. We, we get these other guys a lot. We get paid for overtime. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, you had a lot of success in managing 89, but in 88, you had to endure that whole thing. What kind of advice would you give to Juan Samuel, to whomever the next manager is, to the players, in enduring? what they're going through now based on, on your experience in 88? Well, he just has to keep the, the morale up, uh, be positive, and uh, put down the players in the lineup he think he can be ses successful with that night and, uh, you know, manage the game as he see it and not try to worry about the, the games that has gone by. Think about the game today and do what you can do to win that ball game and be positive and uh, try to take as much of uh, the uh, SWAT light off your players as you possibly can. Uh, you know, I became, uh, uh, I guess, a uh, comedian or some during the course of that 88 season because, you know, you had to laugh, you had to joke, we had to talk to the reporters every day and keep them off, away from the players or keep them from focusing on the players on the field. And uh, people were telling me after it was over that I did a pretty good job of that. But you just have to stay positive. That's all it is to it. You can't get down because the players feed off of you, and you can't fool them. They can look at you and tell if you're down or you don't have confidence in them or whatever, and that's what you have to do. That's the biggest job you have in that situation. Jen. Boog, is there any one home run that's more special than the other for you? Me? Boog. Oh, Boog. What was that again? Is there a home run that's more special than the other for you? Oh, wow, yeah. Um, I would think that the uh, home run I hit against uh, Minnesota in the uh, bottom of the ninth inning over here with a three and two count, and we were run, run down, and I tied the game. And I think Paulie ended up uh, dropping a bunt in, in the 12th inning or something to end up winning the game. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that one hits me. You know, that one hits me. The longest one, I mean, if you want just to, in generalities, I did hit one out of Chicago at Comiskey Park. And it was 415 to the bottom of the fence, 180 feet high. 
and it went out. So halfway to go. That nobody knows how far it went. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a five dollar cab ride though. <laughs> five dollar cab ride. <laughs> and you hit it on the fist, right? I didn't get it all. <laughs> And the inside the park home run in Seattle. Seattle. That was good. <laughs> Off of Steve Barber. Yeah, but tell them about the park. Yeah, yeah the Seattle was like two hundred and sixty feet down the right field line and three sixty to dead center and that was something to see. And it was raining and it was pouring and the wind was blowing in. Oh, and, <laughs> and I crushed it. I mean, <laughs> And I, and I put on the trot, and I'm going around second base, and I said, uh-oh, it's not going to make it. And you know, it I had to down. keep him out of the lineup the next two days yeah. for, hey, I didn't for him to, to catch his breath. I didn't even have to slide, Earl. What are you talking about? Anyway, the ball, Wayne Comer and yeah. was playing center field, and the ball came down, and it hit an abutment and shot out into center field, and I just trotted right on in, you know? Yeah. Only inside the park or ever. <laughs> Brooksy nipped me on triples, though. I think. In fact, I beat uh, everyone who's ever been here on triples. That's system. right, you did. Ooh. I hit into a few triple plays, though, too. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Rocco. Brooks, you were a uh, member of the team before it you know, hit that 65, 66 uh, glory years. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like to go through that whole thing from beginning to the glory years and through and what you can, what advice you can give to the younger players today to help them weather the storm? Yeah, well, I joined the club. Uh, uh, actually, um, I signed right out of high school and uh, played at York and came here the last couple of weeks of the season. And... Uh, we just weren't very good. I mean, we were losing 100, 100 games and lost 100 games the next year. But uh, Paul Richards was here. He had a lot to do with the development of the team, signing young players. And uh, the point, Paul, uh, we were talking about uh, this ball club, I look at it, not to change the subject, but uh, you need some kind of continuity. You can't have six or seven managers in 12 or 13 years, six or seven general managers and expect to win. It's just not going to happen. Every general manager that comes in has got his own philosophy, brings in his own people, might be a little different than the last guy. So that's been a big problem here. But uh, we just started signing uh, better players. Uh, uh, you talk about, you know, in 59 and 60, and 60 was kind of our breakout year, with, especially with the pitching staff. We had four guys who could knock the bat out of your hand, and we gave the Yankees, uh, I think they came in here uh, uh, Labor Day of 1960, two games ahead of us. We won three in a row, went away for two weeks to play, went back to New York, and they beat us four in a row, and I think they ran off like 14 uh, 14 uh, games in a row to, to beat us uh, if we finished second. But we just, we had Ronnie Hanson who came from AAA, he was a rookie of the year that year. We have Marv Breeding. Uh, just had a lot of young guys that kind of came on all of a sudden. And uh, they, um, uh, they had had the experience in the minor leagues. They weren't rushed to the big leagues, I don't think, although Pappas had a, had a short stay there. But we just got better uh, every year. And uh, as I said, 60 was kind of our breakout year. We had good pitching, a pretty good defense, and scored enough runs. That's all I can tell you. Amber. It seems like uh, the, the Nats-Orioles series now is a little bit forced since they came back and that the, the players don't really feel it. Some people in the area that are older that remember the Senators feel it more. Can you maybe describe, any of you describe to some of the younger fans what that relationship was like when there was baseball in Washington uh, back when you guys were playing them? And was it just born from the fact that both of you were good at the time? Yeah, well, I, you know, the, it, it was it was the Yankees were always a big rivalry when I started playing. I mean, when the Yankees came to town, that's when the people came out to, to watch the game. Uh, I played in uh, the presidential opener in Old Griffith Stadium in 1957. The press down threw, threw out the first ball, but I didn't see a, a big rivalry there. Uh, we usually uh, drove home. We drive over, drive back, or you can go on the bus. And I, uh, the, the big rivalry, Amber, was uh, with the Yankees when they came in more than anyone else. But I didn't see a big rivalry between. Washington and Baltimore at that particular time. Not even in 1970 there. I'm sorry? Not even in 1970, Just it was just a team you were playing? Yeah, absolutely. When were they good? Good, both teams have to be good, yeah. David. 
Okay, it's another Frank question, so I apologize, but I want to sort of include everybody in on this because um, everyone else up there pretty much all came up together through the minors. Y'all have known each other, had known each other for years, had been with the club. You a lot of played for Earl and the minors and stuff. Frank, you were still relatively a newcomer um, by even by 69, even though you'd already won a World Series there. How did you become the guy running the kangaroo court? How did that evolve? Well, Billy Hunter appointed me. He came to me one day after a ball game and he says, you know, we should have a kangaroo court and you should be the judge. And I said, why me? He says, because you're the right person for it. I just think you would be good at it and uh, uh, it would be enjoyable. So that's the way it was. Uh, you know, it wasn't that I was any better than anybody else or smarter or whatever. It's just that's the way it was. It could have been anybody, and we'd have still enjoyed the King of Root Court. We really would have. For the rest Don. of you guys, could you guys have? Well, he, you was, uh, he was a leader on the field by what he did. He played the game as hard as anybody played the game ever, and it rubbed off on the other people. And I honestly think that if he saw somebody that wasn't playing it, if, you know, and if I had happened to miss it, that somebody was slacking off, uh, Frank, Frank could tell him. And that's, that's why Billy, you know, just said, go ahead and let's get it, get it going, see what happens. Yeah. Well, we only had it when we won, too. Yeah. So it was incentive to go out and win and see Frank in this mop hat that he was wearing. You know, he had a mop for a wig, yeah. you know, that, and that was pretty funny in itself. Yeah. So we, had, ju we just had to keep winning to see him in that. Yeah, whoever got the uh, weak, weak swing award had to carry a little broken bat around with him until the next time we had the camp. camp you didn't or, want that. Or a shoe, you know, a base running mistake. We had a, someone was a terrible base running organization, but who was that? Biff. We, <laughs> huh? Biff. Well, I don't know about Biff. Uh, his name was John Mason. John Mason. Mason, yeah, it was, and it was the John Mason Award. We had another award too. That if you had a if had a runner on third, you know, with less than two outs, and you didn't get him in, that cost you a dollar. Yeah, that was big. That was a big dollar. You didn't want to give it up. Last question for Don. To, to follow up on what Brooks said about all the turnover in, in, in the front office and the in the dugout, uh, Davy, have you ever thought about, uh, and other guys can follow up. On if you had had a long run as a manager here, what the state of this franchise might be like today? Wow. I'll ask you, but then if you guys. <laughs> Too many general managers. You know, uh, I, I. It's hard to answer. It, ask it one more time. <laughs> Ask it one more time, David. Look, if I would have got to be the manager here, I would have probably been here two weeks or I'd have been here forever because you would have gone to do it my way or the highway. You learn to play this game the way I was taught to play this game, the way they should play this game tonight. And if the GM and the owner didn't try to play a play, if I set a player on the bench and they tried to make me play him, that wasn't going to happen. They were either going to fire me or he was going to sit on that bench. You got to come in here and be able to believe in what you're trying to teach. Till we get that, we're going to continue to lose, period. I'd like to say this. If it wasn't my last year managing, Cal Ripken would have never played shortstop in the big leagues because I didn't care if they fired me. I said to the general manager, look it, I want to satisfy myself that this gentleman can't play shortstop. And I'm going to play him until I'm satisfied that he can't. He never missed a game or anything else after that. But you have to fight your general manager sometimes. Uh, but again, we were blessed with one of the best scouting systems in baseball. And uh, they not only scouted abilities, but intelligence and willing to play, you know, how hard they play. We had, we had good scouts, and that's, that's about it. You, you're going to have to have that. Uh, bless his soul. I love the guy, but Sid Thrift, when he was here, more or less tore up uh, our scouting system, and I don't know about managerials, you know, who was there, but uh, 
we let some pretty good scouts go to other ball clubs. D Davey, do you have any thoughts on what I asked originally? In terms of, have you thought about what the state of this franchise might have been if you had been able to stay here a long time? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we don't want to end it on that note. How about if we... It's uh, <laughs> not the way we want to wrap this up. How about if we have every guy uh, up here on stage just share your most lasting, most indelible moment from the 1970 season? We'll start with Davey. Davey, Davey. Most indelible. Most what? indelible. Last out of the World Series. That's a that was or whoever's well, ready. Well, I'll say, in, in 1970, since I made the last out in 69 and almost got trampled when the Met fans came on the field in Shea Stadium, you know, it just I wanted to be ready to play next year and, went, and, and help us win, and uh, just being on the roster was a big thrill for me. Yeah, we got the last out, you know, when you finally got it. We won the World Series. Wow. Yeah, I agree. Being a World Series champion for a whole year. I just felt good about the fact that uh, we had lost to the Mets. Uh, as I said it earlier, I couldn't believe that they beat us. And then 70, to dedicate ourselves the way we did to come back from 1970 and then face the big red machine in the World Series and make them a little toy wagon, that was fun. <laughs>